is Amy Loebner, and I am one of the development managers, along with my colleague Vanessa, at the Retina Foundation of the Southwest. Thank you all for being with us tonight. As we are all well aware, this year, uh, this past year, excuse me, has challenged us in ways we never could have imagined. However, the Retina Foundation scientists and staff continue to persevere with one shared goal in mind, to advance our unwavering mission to prevent vision loss and restore sight through innovative research and treatment for those individuals impacted by pediatric eye conditions inherited eye diseases and age-related macular degeneration, which are our core three, our three core areas of research at the Retina Foundation. We were able to continue to do this even during a global pandemic because of the support from you, our community. We created this lecture series to bring awareness to and provide education for the public on the most up-to-date research from renowned leaders in our three core areas of research. I would like to recognize and thank Dr. and Mrs. William Hutton for their continued support and for sponsoring the lecture series this year. I will now turn the evening, evening over to Dr. Chalky, our Chief Executive and Medical Officer for the Retina Foundation to introduce our featured speaker, Dr. Robin Geimer. Dr. Chalky? Yes. Well, thank you, Amy. And again, thank you, everybody, for participating. It is really a distinctive honor to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Geimer. Uh, I've known Robin for many, many years. Uh, wonderful person, a good friend, but she's a phenomenal uh, clinician, a scientist. Uh, she's professor of ophthalmology at the Melbourne University and deputy director of the uh, Center for Eye Research in Australia. Uh, she's um, appreciated to be really one of the world's experts on uh, age-related macular degeneration. Uh, she's been awarded the member of the Order of Australia for a significant service. Um, and she has won other awards and has published extensively. And so it really um, is a, a privilege and an honor. And I am so grateful to her to accepting our, our invitation um, for, for speaking with us uh, from Australia, and uh, Robin, uh, welcome to uh, to Dallas. <laughs> Thanks very much, Carl. I've been telling everyone in the office that I'm going to Texas this afternoon, so that's uh, uh, very wonderful that the Zoom and uh, uh, virtual ability to, to connect uh, has meant that I can give this talk today, and thank you and Amy very much for asking me and for arranging for me to give this talk. So welcome everyone. And I understand that there's different levels of understanding of age-related macular degeneration uh, on the Zoom. So let me see if I can take us all on, on a journey. And what I want to talk about is really, is there any um, prospect of us slowing the progression of AMD towards vision loss? Um, sorry, I'm going to see if I can move this on. So, if we think of the, the eye, the retina is like the film of the, of the camera at the back and the macula is this central part of the retina that's responsible for um, the central part of your vision. And in a normal retina, if you look at it face on, you'll see this picture on the left, uh, which is a normal looking retina. And on the right is somebody with the earlier stages of macular generation where you see these little deposits called drusen and some sort of altered pigmentation um, around the central macula. And so they are the earlier stages of AMD for which there is really no symptoms. People don't know they have that. It's usually when they go to the optometrist for glasses or they may have a family history that they want to get uh, checked. But uh, often they, they don't have any symptoms. And it's about one in seven people over 50 uh, will have some of these changes. And the, the worrying thing is that the prevalence is increasing as our population ages. So once you have that risk factor, then not everybody, but again, about one in seven people will go on to what I call vision threatening disease. So that's called late AMD, of which there is the wet form or the neovascular form where you can see here, there's bleeding in the back of the eye and without treatment, you end up with this large scar. Or what probably happens as, a, as sort of the natural history of the disease, if bleeding does not intervene, is that the cells die. And what I tell patients is you get these little moth-eaten holes in the vision where there's bits missing. And again, if, if you don't do anything and it progresses, you just get this large central patch 
where there's no central vision. And um, for those that have heard about macular degeneration, we know that this sort of representation uh, is that you lose your central vision. So reading, driving, recognizing faces, all those quality of life things uh, that you like to do, particularly as we get older and retire, uh, are no longer possible. So there are treatments, uh, and many of you will have heard of treatments uh, for wet AMD, and this has really revolutionized uh, the outcome for the very worst form of this disease. So, but it does require these injections in the eye and they're often lifelong, but really it has been a, a miracle in that it's uh, reduced the, the rate of blindness by, by over half. So that has been a fantastic uh, advance in, in our lifetime. For the dry one, then there's currently still no treatment. We don't know how to keep neurons alive for longer. However, there are now many trials underway um, and some promising results, but also some disappointing results. And I wrote an editorial a few years ago suggesting that maybe it's too late to intervene once you're already uh, along this path uh, where the cells are already started to die. And I called it, maybe you can't turn the ship around. It's too hard to reverse uh, what's already put in place. And so what we really would like to do is to intervene earlier. How could we find the people at risk and do something to stop them progressing to this vision threatening disease. And really this is the urgent unmet need for an effective preventative strategy to slow the progression uh, towards something that yes, maybe we can uh, fix up when it happens, but wouldn't it be better if we could stop it happening in the first place? And it's not really that there's not a lot of ideas out there. And in fact, there are molecules probably sitting on big pharma shelves to try, but so it's not, the problem that we don't have ideas of what to do, it's really how would you design a trial to prove that you have slowed this progression? And the problem is that AMD is a slowly progressive disease in the main. And so if you were going to design a, a study, you really have to run it over many years with many hundreds or thousands of people to be able to prove that you have slowed this uh, early stage getting to the late stage. And in most people's books, this is too hard, too costly, too long, it's just not feasible. And so people just don't embark on that sort of study anymore, or, or even if they um, wanted to, it's just not, not uh, cost effective to do that. So what can we do? So to understand how we might get over this impasse, let me show you this picture. So this is a like a blown up picture of what I showed you before. So on the, the left of this eye with some drusen and pigment, you can see here um, quite a lot of change. And if you wait three years, this eye, and I hope that you can see it, there's this little patch of moth-eaten hole that developed. And this is what currently is that uh, if you had a trial, you would have to wait for this to develop. So this is called geographic atrophy. And clearly, as I've just said, it's a long time to wait for everyone to get to that point to show that whatever you did slowed down that progression. And so more recently, and um, perhaps in the last decade, we've now got this wonderful ability to actually see more of what's going on in the eye than what you would do just by looking in or taking a colored photo, which is what you would see on the left. And indeed, you can now see almost uh, in a living eye what you'd see in the histology. So in the middle picture here is the histology of these drusen underneath the, the retina. And so I'm showing here on the right, what's called an OCT scan, um, where in a living eye, you can actually see pretty much what you see in a histological section. And that has opened up a whole world of understanding what happens as an eye progresses. So if we go back and look at my picture of the colored photos, if you overlay what the OCT scan looks like, you can see uh, on your left all these drusen where there should not be any. If you look up at this normal picture up on the top right, there shouldn't be any lumps and bumps. It should be straight lines, but with the drusen and the little pigment clumps, you see these deposits, which is these early changes in AMD. And then if you look over to the right, when you get the hole in the colored photo, you can see that there's bits missing. Hopefully in that red square, you can see the layers uh, have disappeared uh, where the cells have died. And so we wondered whether or not, if you followed people over time, every get them in often, take pictures, could we actually uh, document what was happening? Sorry, and I'll just go back and play that 
that so this is a video of a person that has come in every three months and if you just look at the druze and the big blob in the middle you can see over time that uh, deposit changes and then finally resolves leaving this hole in the vision and so we wanted to try and see whether we could um, describe what was happening so we had all these people over years that have come in where we actually saw what was happening and we described this thing in 2014 called nascent geographic atrophy so we wanted to say that we thought that these was the beginning early changes of cell death and that that would lead to those holes that you would see when you examine the patient and so we thought well why couldn't this be an endpoint in the study and it happens earlier than having to wait to actually be able to see it uh, on a photo and if you could, if everyone would agree that this would be a, a good place that you could stop your study, then your trial would be shorter, more people would be happy to try their drugs. And so we went ahead and, and uh, wanted to plan a trial using this as an endpoint. Um, but really, no point us in Australia saying in the world, this is what we should do. We really needed to bring uh, a, an international consensus along with us. And so both Carl and I see David there and, and myself are part of this um, group of supposed experts that are called the classification of atrophy group. And we meet every so often and we look at these images for hours and discuss them. But we've all sort of come together to try and um, publish papers where as a group, an international group, we, we think that uh, there are uh, changes that if we could all agree and grade them reproducibly, they would be a good place that you could perhaps uh, aim for in, in a study to try and if you had an intervention that stopped cells from dying, stop that from happening on your scan, then that would show that you'd done something good. And so we've published a couple of papers uh, from this uh, prestigious group that hopefully will influence uh, regulators in their thinking. So in our hands then we were ready then to, to start to look to see whether we could plan a study to slow down the progression of the disease. So what I want to talk about now is that study and, and the idea of using lasers to slow progression of, of macular degeneration. And the particular laser I'm going to talk about is a, a nanosecond laser which basically means it's a very quick uh, pulse laser and by sub-threshold we mean we don't actually see the little burns that you, you put on the retina this is a laser that's so short uh, and you turn it down so low that you don't actually see anything when you're actually applying it. And so the concept of using lasers in AMD was really a very serendipitous observation by Dr. Don Gass, who's sort of the grandfather of medical retinal diseases. And he noted that when he used a thermal laser, so one that actually does burn the retina, when he used it for diabetes, which we still use now in the clinics, you could see that those drusen regressed. And so in the 1990s, and indeed when I was a fellow in the UK, we were, uh, we and others uh, ran these uh, studies to see whether you could use the regular laser in the clinic to eyes with drusen to see if you could slow down progression. And there were several of those studies done. And in 2015, what's called a Cochrane Review, reviewed all these laser studies uh, in eyes that were treated to prevent progression of AMD. And their conclusion was that indeed you could get drusen to resolve, but really there was no difference in the rate of progression to late AMD. So clearly disappointing. But it was thought that maybe the inflammatory insult of that thermal laser, that actual burn of the retina, probably um, offset any benefit that you may have got from, from a process that ended up resolving drusen. And so thermal laser, the lasers that sit in the clinic every day, um, really was not taken any further. But the idea that the la lasers might have induced some beneficial change sort of lingered in people's minds. So in the, to understand what the laser might be doing, we need to then take a look at the, um, our understanding what's happening in AMD. So we don't really know the full um, pathogenesis of AMD. But if you look here on the left, uh, what I'm trying to show here are the photoreceptors. And then there's a layer called the retinal pigment epithelium, which is a layer of cells very crucial for um, keeping the photoreceptors healthy. And the photoreceptors, of course, um, 
gather the light and they're the ones that need to, to process the light that comes in. And that the retinal pigment epithelium sits on a membrane called Brooks membrane. And through that oxygen and nutrients have to get uh, to supply the retina and retinal pigment epithelium. And in return, waste products from the visual cycle have to go through Brooks membrane and get um, removed. And down the bottom is an EM electron microscope picture of a 25 year old Brooks membrane showing how nice and sort of empty it is. And you can imagine not so hard to get oxygen and nutrients through that membrane. But on the right is uh, a situation where we have drusen, so like that scan that shows the lumps and bumps. What you're actually seeing is not only the lumps, but this Brooks membrane is full of debris. And now you can imagine much harder, for whatever reason that accumulates, which is still not, not uh, agreed upon, but you can imagine very important that this is not good for getting oxygen and nutrients through to the retina, nor good for getting rid of waste deposits. And down below is a, a micrograph of a 71 year old's books membrane. And hopefully you can appreciate that it's full of stuff, debris that shouldn't be there. And really the retinal pigment epithelium, that layer that sits on top really is responsible for making what's called metalloproteinases, which is thought to be important for clearing that deposit, that debris. So if the RPE were doing its job properly, that, that should not happen. And that concept was really what drove a guy called John Marshall. He's an expert in lasers in the UK. So his thinking was that, well, if with age, if the retinal pigment epithelium doesn't do its job and actually doesn't make enough of these active metalloproteinases, then it won't clear this membrane. There will be thickening of the membrane. The support, the nutrients getting to the photoreceptors and the RP will be less, and that will lead us to age-related macular degeneration. And so his hypothesis was, could we not make a short pulse laser that didn't cause harm with its thermal damage, targeted the retinal pigment epithelium and triggered some response in those cells and what it, he, what's called rejuvenate them, um, could that lead to clearance of this debris? And in fact, it's really like turning back, back time. Can you make that 70 year old Brooks membrane look more like a 20 year old membrane and thus you would slow the progression of the disease. And indeed that they had an experiment where they got these retinal pigment epithelial cells, they put it in a dish, they lasered them with a laser. And this is just one of these metalloproteinases. As you can see a few days after the laser, they cause copious amounts of these metalloproteinases to be released. So following on from that, they approached a company in Australia. So it so happens that Australia makes quite good retinal lasers. Uh, and a company called Alex that lives in South Australia down the bottom of Australia was approached uh, with the challenge to make what's called a nanosecond laser. So a very short pulse with the idea being that it uh, is so short, it does not heat the tissue. So a three nanosecond pulse is to give you some idea, 33 million times shorter pulse than a regular pulse that we would be using in those thermal lasers. So incredibly short time that it's delivered. And as a result, it does not cause this um, heat and thus doesn't destroy the tissue around it. Uh, and so it ends up that you actually apply about a thousand less times less energy than what we've been using uh, in those previous lasers. And they designed this, the beam of the laser to be speckled so that you, in aiming to um, target the retinal pigment epithelium to, to actually kill off some of them in the hope that you cause the others to divide and slide, um, they've created this speckled pattern. So only uh, a, a small percent uh, are killed off in any area. So the hope is that when you destroy this monolayer of cells, you make the other cells have to produce these metalloproteinases to be able to slide or divide and fill in the hole that you have created. And so with my colleague, Erica Fletcher at the University of Melbourne, we did this laser in some mice. So you can get mice that have a thickened Brooks membrane. And here on the top, uh, there's a normal mouse Brooks membrane. And then on the, the right is a Brooks membrane that is very thick. Hopefully you can see that. So in this mouse after laser, if we look down on the, the uh, bottom left, 
uh, a, a, um, a mouse with a thick and Brooks membrane, this APOE mouse, has um, um, very low levels of these metalloproteinases. And then after laser, hopefully you can see they started to produce in the eye that we lasered amounts that were comparable to a normal mouse. But not only that, interestingly, in the actually the eye that we didn't laser, so the other eye, we also saw an increase in these important molecules that were going to clear up Brooks membrane. And then when we actually looked at Brooks membrane, again, in this mass model, it's very thick. And then after the laser in the eye that we lasered, it was reduced. And not only that, in the fellow eye, there seemed to be a less effect, but certainly some suggestion that there might actually be a, a systemic effect or an effect in the other eye that we did not even touch with the laser. And here is uh, some nice examples uh, on your left is this control mouse's Brooks membrane and underneath that big thick membrane of the APOE mouse. And after laser on the right, the control mouse Brooks membrane was thinner, but hopefully you can see very nicely that this abnormal thick Brooks membrane also became thin. So having done that, we also had the opportunity, which is quite rare, to find somebody in the clinic that actually has a disease where they're going to have to lose their eye. So this is a lady that uh, had a very nasty tumour of her lid, and she allowed me to laser her eye before it was going to be removed at surgery to basically save her life from this aggressive cancer. And you can see here uh, the, the laser that I produced, and I actually did it slightly uh, at greater intensity than I would do it uh, in the study, just so we can see where we lasered. And you get the idea on the OCT scan that this is a laser spot. And uh, so that eye was then beautifully preserved by Erica Fletcher. And I also did uh, the normal laser. So the top picture shows uh, a thermal laser burn and hopefully you can see that there's quite a lot of destruction uh, from the, the thermal laser on the top. And down the bottom is this uh, nanosecond laser where the little uh, green cells are, are the RPE cells. And this is an area that I lasered. So beautiful uh, retina remaining uh, and did not get destroyed by the laser. And then if you look at the RPE cells, that layer that we're trying to target, you can see a beautiful mosaic of this layer, um, which wasn't treated. And then I was able to treat the eye five days before the eye was removed. So you can see the hole in the middle panel that was created five days previously. But I also lasered her a month before she had her surgery. And you can see that the RPE has done what we had postulated that it would do. It would uh, fill up the hole that I had created. So in the human, we can't prove categorically that the cells divide, but we can certainly show you that they, they moved. And to be able to slide to fill in the hole, they have to make those metalloproteinases so that they can slide on Brooks membrane. So that was a very uh, useful and a very uh, welcome use of that eye that was unfortunately being removed. So as a result of that, we went on and did a pilot study of 50 eyes to check that the concept was uh, reasonable, that it was safe. And uh, this was done and, and uh, this is a picture of me and the chief engineer having a very sophisticated discussion on uh, the RPE sliding in that top uh, picture. But at the end of 50 patients, it appeared safe. And we did think we saw some uh, improvement in, in how the macula appeared and the function of the retina. So as a result of that, we went on and uh, planned this large study called the LEAD study, which was looking at this subthreshold nanosecond laser aiming to slow the progression of these earlier stages of AMD. And our plan was to do a proper randomized uh, sham controlled uh, clinical trial in people with bilateral large drusen, so what's called intermediate AMD, so high risk of progressing and see whether we could slow the, slow the disease. Uh, so it was a 36 month study. It was done um, in a multi-center way. We started in 2012. It took us a long time to recruit uh, patients because of course people with intermediate AMD without symptoms don't present to hospitals or retinal specialists, they're in the community. So this was perhaps one of the first um, times where people were trying to find these people with earlier disease. The last patient had their last visit in May 2018. And every six months we, uh, we either applied 12 spots of laser or 12 just flashes of light every six months for 36 months and followed them up. We had six sites, uh, five in Australia and one in Northern Ireland. 
So we got 292 participants and they all had what's called intermediate AMD. So high risk, but still early disease. And they were randomized to either have this sham or this laser. And so, well, what endpoint were we going to use? So how would we know if the laser worked? It's probably not enough just to show that the drusen disappeared because we saw that drusen disappeared on the way to atrophy. And traditionally in AMD trials, you use visual acuity as an endpoint, but that's usually when you're looking to stop the bleeding and, and without that, the vision drops. Whereas in these cases, the vision is pretty normal for a long time. So we couldn't use um, vision as our, our endpoint. So if we cast our, eye, our mind back to what we started with, um, we decided we would want to stop people getting to traditionally defined late AMD, which is this wet and this dry. But also we included as this combined endpoint, this new finding that on the OCT, you could find these early signs of cell death. And we would argue that if you could slow down this nascent geographic atrophy, then that's a good thing. So this design allowed us to do this early intervention with not so much money and not so much um, resources to do a much bigger study. And actually it allows, um, it provided a trial design so that others can now follow to do early intervention studies. But at the time we did this, and even now the FDA and other regulators don't approve this nascent GA as an endpoint, but uh, hopefully at some point in the near future, they may come to think that if you slow down cell death, then, then that has got to be a good thing. And I, I suspect if we tried to run this with a big pharmaceutical company, they would not ever do this because it, they need to have FDA um, endpoints, whereas we were able um, to do this. So after all that preamble, we did this study and the overall result at three years was no significant difference in the rate of progression. So the orange line is the laser group and uh, the dotted green is the sham. So if you take everybody and do this, then unfortunately at the end of the day, no difference. However, there is um, some more to the story. Um, so I haven't really told you everything about what we know about um, intermediate AMD. So on the left is what we've just been talking about, this drusen, um, but actually because of our ability now to image the eye much better, we have all come around to recognizing a different phenotype of AMD. And these are people with deposits that are called pseudodrusen. So not drusen, but pseudodrusen. Uh, and they have this sort of net-like pattern. So they're called reticular pseudodrusen. And they're recognized as a high risk um, characteristic in people with the earlier stages of AMD. And down the bottom there, you may be able to appreciate that the deposits are slightly different to the one on the left. They actually deposit above this retinal pigment epithelium rather than underneath. And so again, we had another eye of another lady who had another aggressive tumor of her lid and she had a very strong family history of AMD, but she herself was not thought to have AMD yet her eye was riddled with these reticular pseudodrusen. And hopefully you can see here this enlarged picture on the OCT and then this particular deposit on this beautiful histology shows this a, a massive amount of deposit that's not supposed to be in amongst our beautiful photoreceptors. So these are these reticular pseudodrusen. And so when you look at the eye, that was the one that was donated from the lady again with her needing to remove her eye from for tumor, you can see areas where there isn't reticular pseudodrusen, the retinal pigment epithelium looks very healthy. But in areas where there are reticular pseudodrusen, that hopefully you can see it's irregular, the RPE are distorted, they are different sizes. And so the thought was, well, what if our laser um, was not a good idea in people who have this really sick RPE? Maybe it's so dysfunctional that maybe our laser, which you remember, destroys some of the RPE, it may not be a good idea. So we thought to do this post hoc analysis. So Due to our current understanding of how that laser worked, it causes selective loss of the retinal pigment epithelium. What if um, its impact could differ depending on how sick the RPE were? And perhaps that high risk phenotype with those funny deposits seen beautifully there uh, on the, the right, maybe it's not a good idea to look at, to treat those. So we did this thing called a post hoc analysis where it's sort of an afterthought and by the mere fact that it's an afterthought makes it 
not as not as robust as if we had a thought about it at the beginning when we really didn't know about reticular pseudodrusin, what would the results be? Well, here they are very interesting. So now if you divide the population into the vast majority of people who don't have reticular pseudodrusin, then we see a big difference in the response to the laser. So the people who had the laser had much slower progression to late AMD than those that did not. So in, indeed there was a four fold reduction in the three quarters of the people that did not have reticular pseudodrusin. And indeed in those people who did have reticular pseudodrusin, so that high risk um, phenotype, there was probably, although um, not as uh, statistically significant as the, the other way around, but these people did look to be doing worse um, than those that didn't have the laser. So there was a two to three fold increased risk of progression if you had the, the laser. So you can see if you put the whole group together, there was no difference. But if we separate them on the basis of this particular subgroup, then there was. And I'll just show you a picture here. This is somebody uh, at baseline with the conventional drusen. Uh, and this picture on your right is when you measure the function of the retina and green is good. So all the green dots mean that the function is pretty normal and orange and red is not good function. Uh, and you can see uh, after 12 months, hopefully you can appreciate there's less drusen uh, and the function seemed to improve uh, in this eye that, that was the, the group that seemed to do well. The contralateral, the con converse is this person with a lot of reticular pseudodrusen in this eye, already at baseline, their function was very poor, even though they still had um, good uh, visual acuity. When you ask them to see dim light, they really couldn't see it. And uh, you can see even where I put the laser uh, has caused little patches of atrophy around the laser, but the, the middle retina is, is just um, uh, uh, continuing to have atrophy. Um, so that really did not help that person at all. So we were able to uh, follow most of our patients for another two years. And so at the two main sites, which was ourselves and one other, we managed to be able to follow up 212 of the original 292 people for another two years. So we didn't treat them. They stopped their treatment at month 30, but we did follow them for another 30 months. And we wanted to know, did that separation in progression still persist? And so again, overall, there was no significant difference to the endpoint of this combined uh, late AMD endpoint. But interestingly, so two years after we stopped treatment, we still saw this separation uh, of effect. So in those people without this high risk uh, phenotype, there still seemed to be a persistent beneficial effect um, having not applied the laser for the last two years compared to the sham group. Uh, in those without reticular pseudodrusin, and again, uh, a, a bad progression in those people with that high risk group and uh, compared to sham. So overall then, in conclusion, the subthreshold nanosecond laser seems to be safe. Uh, it did not cause wet AMD, which was always a worry um, from some of the results from the earlier thermal laser studies. So in people with drusen, there was no significant difference overall in the progression rate to late AMD in those receiving the laser compared to sham. However, uh, there may be a role in slowing the progression in the majority of people who do not have reticular pseudodrusin. And it might be inappropriate um, for those people with reticular pseudodrusin. But just to reiterate, it's what's called this post hoc analysis. It's really supposed to be hypothesis generating. You really should not claim too much from, from these analysis. The five-year extension did show a persistence of this beneficial effect in those without reticular pseudodrusin, suggesting that you may not have to have this ongoing treatment. If we truly did cause the RPE cells to divide or become rejuvenated, which is a terrible term, sounds like something you do in a, a plastic surgery laser salon, but anyhow, that's what it's called, rejuvenation. You may not need to have ongoing treatment. We don't think that our findings can be extrapolated to other short pulse lasers. So there are other lasers out there that aren't nanosecond, they're microsecond, but it may well be that they still cause some inflammatory response. So I don't, we don't think that you can just take these findings and think that all short pulses will do the same. And of course, we're very encouraged by the results, but they do require um, further confirmation in, in further trials. And so what's next? So 
we need to validate those results. Um, we need to talk to the regulatory authorities to see how they would want to, a trial to, to be um, planned. Would they accept NACE and GA as an endpoint? This planning is currently underway and certainly we're a long way down a tr track of, of um, performing another study, hopefully mainly in the United States. Uh, and we're talking with the FDA as to how, what that trial would look like. If the intervention is beneficial, then we still need to optimize the protocols. Do we really need so often treatment? Uh, maybe one, a once-off treatment might be enough to divide those RPE into what's called daughter cells that are half the age and, and twice as, as uh, good as they were when they were older. Maybe we don't need to do 12 spots or maybe we need to do more, maybe 100 spots and a lot of subthreshold lasers use many more spots than 12. Um, we need to understand better the action of the laser, this concept that it actually may benefit both eyes um, suggests that there's a systemic effect. And certainly with some of our research, we do see changes in the macrophage function, uh, which is important for perhaps getting rid of some of that debris. Uh, so if you take the blood of people that have had laser uh, for about a year, you can see differences in their blood. And it's clearly critical that we understand better these reticular pseudodrusin because for the first time with this treatment, we've shown a very different response with this treatment and, and any further treatments or different treatments may also have this different response. So we really need to know what's causing this high risk um, phenotype. So that's my talk. I'd like to thank my macular research unit uh, at the Centre for Eye Research Australia. And Erica Fletcher uh, is my um, basic science uh, colleague at the University of Melbourne. And then uh, down the bottom are the uh, investigators in, in that uh, laser study where they, they truly did do um, a good job without much support to get this study uh, done. And finally, uh, my funders are the um, National Health and Research Council in Australia, Bupa and Alex is the laser company that now is called Nova Eye Medical. So I thank you very much for listening um, and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Robin. As, as you know, I, I said to the group, this really, uh, Robin is, is really uh, the, one of the world's experts on dry AMD. And um, this trial was truly um, in, you know, monumental in terms of our understanding of, of novel treatments and things like that. So, you know, I really want to thank you. Um, you know, while I wait for people to kind of gather their thoughts, because this was, you know, such a, a beautiful talk, you know, I guess one of the questions that always I think is, is difficult for me to communicate, um, because also conceptually, you know, when we talk about patients with dry AMD, when we see them and several people, you know, as I said, you know, when they've been told they have dry AMD, you know, you've pointed out that not all dry AMD is the same, right? Um, so how do you think in terms of, you know, are there really two types of diseases in terms of dry AMD? Are there this reticular uh, component and, and normal dry AMD? Um, you know, is it a mixture of both? You know, how do you, and also how do you explain this to patients? Because, you know, are we really thinking that these are almost two separate diseases, but they obviously, obviously many times uh, intermix and you can have components of both. So I'm just wondering if you would share with folks mm. your own thinking about going forward, how do we think of mm. uh, the complexity of dry AMD? Yeah, thanks, Carl. So um, as, as you know, uh, anything at the back of the eye that looks like a drusen, we call AMD. So probably there are many more phenotypes than just the two we've touched on today. Um, and so uh, up until we've had this ability to image the retina so beautifully, we've sort of lumped everything into AMD. And clearly there are different sorts of deposits, um, not only those two, there's an, uh, some others as well. So, however, and we also know that reticular pseudodrusin is not only confined to AMD, you do see it in other retinal diseases. So my way of thinking is it's like a two hit problem. You, you can have genetic risk factors that give you conventional drusen. And yes, you do progress, uh, but perhaps not to the extent that we'd all been thinking. It's really the combination of two problems. One that gives you 
uh, conventional Jerusalem, which may well be a lipid or a complement uh, gene pathway problem. But if in addition, you, for example, have hypoxia, so you have cardiovascular disease or you smoke or, or there's an, or, or there's other reasons where why you might not have a good blood supply to your retina. So the two things together is bad news. So our, our current thinking, and we have a big study trying to work out what the cause of reticular pseudodrusin are, but let's assume it's hypoxia. So yes, people have a genetic predisposition to conventional drusen, but in those people that in addition have that added risk factor, let's say poor blood poor oxygen to the retina for whatever reason, it pushes you forward. And indeed, if you look in the late AMD clinic, so if you bother now to go to all your injecting clinics, the vast majority of people have reticular pseudodrusin. And I don't think the reticular pseudodrusin caused the late AMD. I think whatever caused the late AMD also caused the reticular pseudodrusin. So in my mind, it's hypoxia. So you've got this problem with getting nutrients through to the retina. And then on top of that, you throw in another problem, which is poor supply. And now we have the imaging that can tell us what the blood supply, the back of the eye is. I, th I think uh, that's a nice model of explaining why we end up with people with reticular pseudodrusin at the, at the if you just look at late AMD, the vast majority have that, that reticular pseudodrusin. That's very helpful. I'll open it up. I have another, another question, but I'll let other people, David or Lou or anybody else, if you have questions, I'm going to open it up to the floor here just for a second so I don't hog uh, Robin's time. There's a hand up with um, oh, M. Sorry. Yes, go ahead. Yes, it's, uh, Mehmet Candace, uh, thank you for a very nice talk, uh, very informative. Uh, my question is um, related to uh, the biochemical nature of these debris is not known. However, uh, the culprit is definitely oxidative metabolism in nature. Uh, if the oxidative stress is involved, then it will be uh, plausible to expect that maybe antioxidants will help uh, the, uh, at least alleviate the, uh, the furthering of the, uh, this debris accumulation along with the metalloproteases which are naturally inhibited. And um, if there are inhibitors to those inhibitors together with the antioxidants and bombarding with the laser in a combination therapy, will it, would you predict that it will probably um, help the getting rid of these um, heart to proteolytic uh, or the mm. cold spots to melt? Mm. Certainly there are people and trials are underway that um, are trying to reduce the antioxidant effect. And indeed the, the vitamin supplements, um, the arid supplements are sort of uh, act as a, as a protection from antioxidant damage. So I think uh, potentially you could certainly uh, combine treatments um, and we see that treating wet AMD, we want to combine something that stops blood vessels with something that stops inflammation and cell death. So it could well be that uh, the answer is multifaceted. And also there may well, well be some phenotypes of AMD that are more due to oxidative damage and some that are more due to lipid metabolism and some in my thinking due to vascular disease. So yeah, I think we have to be a bit more sophisticated in, um, in uh, segregating the disease. And we'll, we'll, I think we'll find that and perhaps genetics will help us a little bit more. At the moment, we have good insight into some of the pathways involved in AMD, but I'm sure there's more to learn. Thank you. Great. Um, so I'm curious, you know, um, what do you think about, and, you know, we have folks on the audience who are, you know, inter you know uh, inter uh, interested in, in novel functional assessments. But I'm curious as to your thoughts about, um, you know, what patients complain about vis-a-vis -vis either reticular pseudodrusin, normal drusen, and if we, you know, subjectively in your lead trial, uh, if you saw patients who subjectively could kind of um, articulate what mm -hmm. they felt was an improvement or was this yep. simply slowing of the progress, right? Because I mm -hmm. do think that one of the challenges we have with these patients is they, they do have some visual complaints. Are we gonna be obligated to kind of 
improve those complaints or are we just going to try to prevent further progression, um, which as you know, can be somewhat more challenging, right? When we talk mm-hmm. about this as a treatment for patients, you know, if I tell Mrs. Smith, oh, I'm going to do this, it's not going to get you better today, but in two years from now, you're going to be very grateful that I did it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You all so, it, see yep. lead study. Hmm. so interesting, Carl, often without any prompting, they will say that they started driving at night again. So um, um, I don't know why, um, whether it was less glare or less time to adjust to the dark, but without even asking a, 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 a nighttime questionnaire, some of them, that was the, the most remarkable thing was they would say they they by themselves stopped driving at night because it was too hard and now they now drive at night. And I see Lewis has a, a question on the chat about... Um, functional consequences of nascent GA. So the problem, as you point out, this nascent GA is just a tiny little bit. And the the way we test function is to put little dots on the retina and ask them when they can see it. And unless the spot is right over a bit that developed nascent GA, the bit next door can be totally normal. So therein lies a big problem of how we, if if the regulatory authorities want a functional benefit or the patient wants to see a functional benefit, uh, unless you have a, an ability to, to, to measure the entire retina, you just luck whether or not you, you hit on a bit that's going to become this nascent GA. So definitely the function is down. So we do do some studies where we actually map where we're going to test uh, on the retina as to where the nascent GA is, and you can show it's down. Um, but on a standard grid that you would do for everybody, it's just, just luck. But as you know, seeing in the dark is a a very early complaint that people have difficulty um, adjusting uh, from being from the light to the dark. And that is um, very much a characteristic of those with particular pseudodrusin. So we had started uh, trying to measure dark adaptation in these people. But if you back in 10 years ago, the machinery was not as good as it is now. And it's quite laborious for people to do, particularly elderly people. So we found that quite difficult, but I do think that that would be something that would change. And the concept being that if Brooks membrane was thinner, if the RPE was working better, you should see an improvement in dark adaptation. It's just that we uh, stopped doing it after about a year because basically um, our equipment uh, kept failing uh, that we were using. Yeah, I would, I would agree. And then also, I'm going to follow up with Lou, who also had this problem, you know, the hypoxia, of course, is, is, you know, this whole cardiovascular, and we know there's an association between heart disease and macular degeneration. Um, but what is your, you know, data or what's your concept about the role of diabetes, um, you know, in, in, in terms of AMD or particular pseudodrus and hypoxia, are there additional, you know, metabolic factors that, that may play a role or that, you, that, we, that you've seen in any of your data that would suggest that there are some additional risk factors that we, we need to be aware of? Mm. So it's in, the diabetes one is interesting in that, I don't know about you, but you hardly find the two things together. You, you have diabetic clinics and you have AMD clinics and usually the two do not meet. And whether that's because people with diabetes don't tend to necessarily to get, get as old as people with AMD, who knows, but it's, it's fascinating that you don't tend to see the, this, the two together. And I guess in diabetes is much more a, a upper in the top of the retina hypoxic problem rather than down the bottom. And I think in AMD, it's this sort of concept of a watershed that you've just got enough oxygen <clears throat> to do the job if everything's working well. And it's just this dip down uh, in oxygen um, that might just be enough to cause a, this sort of chronic problem. Whereas diabetes, I think is, you know, it's more a, a, a vessel disease uh, that's perhaps not so chronic. Our current thinking, and probably I have to kill you all after I tell you because we haven't published on it yet, but um, sleep apnea and, uh, and uh, what's called sleep disordered breathing is a much unrecognized risk factor um, and becoming much more known and something like about 30% of people over 60 are thought to have some degree of sleep disorder breathing. And the retina is most active at night. It's when you have to regenerate all your photopigment. Uh, and so our current 
uh, one of our current streams of what we're looking at is uh, sleep apnea or sleep disordered breathing as a risk factor, which ophthalmologists never ask about um, as a, a potential um, uh, risk factor for, for hypoxia. So that's uh, what we're very interested in at the moment. And we're currently giving people with AMD little pulse oximeters to take home and, and wear for a couple of nights so that we can see how much the oxygen dips at night. Uh, and uh, watch watch this space. But um, if that were the case, then then there are treatments. Well, that's fascinating. David, you have a question in the chat. Oh, I got to come off mute. You have to yeah. come off. So I was I was wondering, you know, with the uh, nascent GA endpoint, is it a an all or nothing, a yes no kind of endpoint binary, or is it uh, extensive? Can you measure the extent of NGA too and follow it over time? Mm. Yep. So in our lead study, it was um, it was they were it was a grading uh, center uh, uh, defined uh, endpoint. So once they got it once, then we stopped the laser. They had reached their endpoint, and that's what we did. Mm -hmm. In the CAM studies, those international groups, um, we're we're struggling with defining. Uh, we would like to define AMD like in diabetes, where there's like a, a several step progression. And at the moment, there is no size criteria for nascent GA. Um, and unfortunately, the definition that we had used, uh, because it's a consensus, we had to concede that, uh, uh, go with the majority. And, and so the current international consensus is for something slightly different to what we had uh, suggested as, as the endpoint. So we're still working, there's still work to do to agree on what's gradable, what's repeatable, what can everyone agree as an endpoint. Um, and so the most recent uh, work we were involved in was getting six reading centers around the world to grade nascent GA or, or what's called intermediate RP and outer retinal atrophy and a more advanced group, complete RP and outer retinal atrophy to see how well the reading centers could do. And that paper, which is just published shows that our, what we wanted for, for a definition of, of cell death, which is where you could see that sort of dipping down that what we call a vortex or subsidence was the most reproducibly um, graded uh, change amongst these uh, six reading centers. And that from our point of view is very good because we, we think that is a, a definite uh, point in the sand that, that we can all agree upon. Earlier than that, I think there's a lot of uh, difficulty in everyone agreeing what, in what they're seeing. So, so in our mind, and we have published that the risk of from going from nascent GA to GA is, is an odds ratio of like 80. So once you've got the, as you could well imagine, once you've got the beginning of cell death, it's going to become uh, conventional geographic atrophy. So there's still some agreement to be done, and I'm sure the regulatory authorities will have some some input into what actually is, is required to, to say that you've reached a point where everyone is sure that if, if it continues, it will lead to vision loss. Great. Great. Well, th thank you. Well, Robin, again, I can't thank you enough for uh, spending your, your morning uh, with us. Um, you know, this was a phenomenal discussion and I really want to thank you for, for everything that you do and, uh, and thank you for participating. And Amy and Vanessa, I'm going to give the floor back to you so we can close uh, this, this meeting. Thanks again, Robin. Mm, thanks very much. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Chucky. And Vanessa is just pulling up um, a screen here for you all to see just um, a few updates about upcoming events. One that we are uh, very excited to announce, um, you all should have received information about this, but if you didn't, is our annual event this year in partnership with the Dallas Regional Chamber and up close and personal with Dr. Anthony S. Fauci, um, our event that will take place virtually on Thursday, June 3rd at 7 p.m. And if you would like more information, you are welcome to reach out directly to me or visit our website, retinafoundation.org. Additionally, other ways um, to get involved in the Retina Foundation, I'll just wait for 
the slide here. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, we do have a couple of other really exciting events as well. So we started this year our Retina Foundation Scientist Hour. So we love to bring in individuals like Dr. Geimer who are experts in their respective areas. However, our scientists at the Retina Foundation um, respectively are uh, experts as well. And so we like to highlight them and to um, provide you all with information about their research. So that next scientist hour is Wednesday, June 23rd. And then this will conclude our lecture for the spring and we will resume the lecture series this fall, Thursday, September 23rd and Tuesday, October 19th. Um, lastly, uh, another way to become involved is through becoming a member of our auxiliary. And that really is a way for you to become an ambassador for the Retina Foundation. And uh, like um, most organizations these days, you can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and the other various um, social media platforms here. But we welcome you um, to reach out to myself and my colleague, Vanessa, um, should you have any questions or interested in learning more about our three core areas of research um, and ways to, to get involved. So with that, um, our contact information is here, can also be found on our website, but I would just like to take this opportunity to again, thank Dr. Geimer for joining us. We're grateful to have you and to hear about your research um, that you're doing. And with that, we will conclude the program. Thanks so thank much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.